was easy. He was obsessed with her. It's a heinous crime. I didn't do any of this. Welcome down the rabbit hole, friends. We're here today to review both episodes two and three of the new Grant Amato series called Control Plus Alt Plus Desire. I know we don't like the title very much, but it's available through Paramount and you can get it on Amazon. And quite frankly, this is one of the most shocking docuseries I've ever watched because in episode three, we get a true conclusion to a true crime murder case. I've never seen anything like it and I'm excited to go through all of it with you now. He said that the devil would come to him and told him that I was going to be his greatest failure. To kind of destroy me inside. Okay, so episode two I'm only going to talk about briefly because it's primarily about Sylvie, the Bulgarian webcam girlfriend. And really the purpose of episode two is setting everything up for the final episode, which is shocking and groundbreaking, all right? But in episode two, Grant does let us know that his father came out and said he was very disappointed in Grant for everything that happened. And you just saw a clip in which allegedly, according to Grant, um, his father took him outside and let him know, like, I literally feel that I've been told by the devil that you will be the greatest failure of my lifetime. I have to say that I'm not sure we can believe a damn word that Grant says, and we're going to delve more into that once episode three comes along. There appeared to be some type of tears, but I didn't believe they were real. We do hear from the initial investigators who let us know that right off the bat when they first arrested Grant and brought him to the police station and started interrogating him, he was just acting bizarrely. He had no response to the level of legality that was going on around him. He was very blank faced and he acted as though it was no big deal to be sitting there and being interrogated by these police officers for a period of up to four hours, I believe. She does acknowledge that when they finally showed him the pictures of his family's dead bodies, he responded by putting his head down and sort of acting like he was crying, but she lets us know in person she saw zero tears. And it makes perfect sense to me as we're about to find out who Grant truly is on the inside. There's been no new evidence to link anything to me. My story is what my story's always been. In episode two, when Grant starts meeting with a documentarian over the prison phone system, he upholds the idea that he's innocent. He makes very vague statements saying like there's no new evidence and it's clear that he believes he actually states he believes that he's not going to be found guilty um, and even after he's found guilty he believes that his appeals will go through and it's clear to him he says it's clear that i didn't commit this crime this is a criminal case Grant Amato is charged with first degree premeditated murder. We take a look at the trial, which in my opinion was very cut and dry. The prosecutor stated, if not Grant Amato, then who? All of the evidence contributed back to the idea that Grant was the only one who could have committed these crimes. It had to be done by someone who was in the house around the time frame in which he admitted to being there. And the crime scene indicated that none of the victims had unalived themselves. So there was no way that this was a murder-suicide, which is kind of what Grant's defense was leaning towards. Grant's defense lawyer is also interviewed, and he makes it clear that in this case, his number one goal was to ensure that Grant didn't get the death penalty. He really doesn't talk much about getting him found not guilty. On the surface, we all look so prim and perfect. Bunch of college graduates, had a lot of money in the family, and we we're just responsible people. But underneath the surface, there's all the skeletons. Okay, this is where I very much expected Grant Amato to bring in new evidence of his family being incredibly abusive and there being like a lot of skeletons in the closet. But spoiler alert, he doesn't. <laughs> I mean, I really thought that was what part of the documentary was going to be about. But I don't really hear him in these episodes bringing up many instances of inappropriate behavior. Now, he does go into explaining that his dad was very angry with him about all of the things that were happening with Sylvie and with the money, that his mom was more understanding, allegedly according to him, 
um, and that his father was also claiming that he was going to divorce his mother, that there was just such a disintegration of the family over everything that had happened revolving around Grant, and you know his dad was done with everyone. Um, he also brings up that his dad made some comments to him about the devil telling him he was his greatest failure in life. And so we do hear that maybe emotionally his dad was not as supportive as some of the other family members. And in the past, Grant has said that his dad was abusive, like physically abusive towards his mom, but that's not even brought up here in this part of the docuseries. So for me, I was kind of surprised because I don't get a sense that this was a terribly abusive family, even coming straight out of Grant Amato's mouth. In Bulgaria, and a woman named Sylvie. Sylvie is an internet cam mom. Okay, to summarize all of it, the rest of episode two for me is really about Sylvie. She is a Bulgarian cam girl who's been allegedly very successful on the website and company that she works for. You can still find her on Twitter. I'll put some screenshots up here. She is all over Twitter, still working hard. Um, and the rest of this episode, it. There's some interviews with other cam girls who may work for the same company, and it's just kind of explaining to you and showing you the kind of work that someone like Sylvie does, the fact that it's not always just sexual, that they actually create um, re relationships, emotional relationships with their top clients. And Grant was, you know, allegedly one of those people for Sylvie. Um, they will listen to them. They will, you know, put on this kind of facade of caring deeply for them and the cam girls do say sometimes you do really come to care about and love these people but you also have to keep up the appropriate boundaries and you are talking to many of them at the same time and the motivation is money and the most important point that i really think the documentarians want to drive home in this episode is that when this case exploded and it was all over the media and people were very, were very interested in it many people began to question and attack sylvie and her role in this crime now for me and also i think it's made clear that it's the documentarians opinion as well um, sylvie is someone who is doing a job there has never been any evidence, none at all, that she supported or um, pushed Grant to do any of these horrible things to his family, quite the opposite. Now, allegedly she did kind of punish him and stop speaking to him after she was informed by his parents that he had been using their money. So I really don't know what more she could do. She's not responsible for what Grant did. And we're really going to talk more about this again in episode three, where I think we get more shocking revelations about what's really going on here. And the last last important part of episode two is that Grant awkwardly and weirdly divulges to the documentarian that he finally, like years later, got a letter from Sylvie. Um, they read part of it. It seems very questionable and you can tell the documentarian is flat out asking him, like, is this real? And that there's no concrete answer from Grant. I think we're meant to realize that it's likely this is another lie that he's telling. But clearly, Grant is pushing the people who are working on this project to try to go after Sylvie, to find her, to talk to her, to put her on the show, to tell Grant what happens. And these are all pieces of what he wants to accomplish by even allowing these documentarians into his life. And that's really the crux of episode two for me. I first got in touch by writing him physical letters, like wrote a lot, a lot. And we talked like almost every day, multiple times. Okay, moving into episode three, here's where things get crazy. Um, first, by the end of this entire docuseries, I realized that Mary, the friend who's being interviewed about Grant Amato and her current relationship with him, is the girlfriend that I put out a video about just last week. So take a look at that video if you're confused. But let me tell you some stuff about Mary. Mary's being interviewed for this docuseries to talk about like how Grant is now, how he's interacted with her. 
Mary makes it clear that they used to have a closer relationship. It kind of sounds to me like before, and you can hear that in her interview in my um, video last week, they were, they considered themselves like girlfriend and boyfriend. And since then, there's been a little bit of space created between them. And a part of the reason is because Mary started to become very popular online. And it's possibly as a cam girl. I can't tell if it's a cam girl or some kind of like YouTube thing, but she's gained quite a big following by presenting herself as a young schoolgirl who dresses in like kind of very anime type clothing. All right. So of course, Grant is super into this. Mary also lets us know that when she first got to know Grant, she realized that hundreds of women were writing to him. But Grant says like she was special to him because she was different and she wasn't all about being with him because he's a murderer. Watch my last video to hear more about that and he felt that she was a more genuine person. For Mary's part of this, I mean, it's absolutely insane. Again, go back and watch my video about her because you will see that Mary has a tendency towards psychopathic traits. Um, for Mary's part of this, she's just very much like inappropriate and bizarre. Okay, the way that she talks about Grant is just weird. She basically says that she doesn't like him. She thinks it's gross what he did to his family. But then at the same time, she believes everybody wears a mask. We all just go around wearing masks, playing a character. And, you know, everybody has this inside of him. He just acted on it. And that makes him strong and therefore more attractive to her. It is a crazy messed up relationship. And we'll hear more about it a little bit later in this episode. Hi, sweetie. How are you doing? I just wanted to say hi and then I'm thinking of you and I can't wait to see you and talk to you tonight because you're my precious little kitty. Yes, it's true. Grant Amato has access to a phone and a tablet and he talks to this girl and probably many other girls in really gross and disgusting ways over these devices. Prison is different than it used to be and different from what we imagine it to be, okay? Um, so if you want to hear more about this cringeworthy BS, you can check out my video from last week where there's actually a one-on-one -on -one interview with this girl named Mary and she divulges all kinds of crazy crap. Like promoting my image and stuff. So those are some images to give you an idea of what Mary is up to online. You can see she has kind of like a kitty theme and Grant calls her his little kitty. It's absolutely disgusting. But towards the end of episode three, Grant recognizes and he says it and he says what all of us are thinking, that he's kind of reenacting the entire relationship that he had with Sylvie but that it might be in a backwards kind of situation in the beginning. Um, now she's taken a distance from him, but early on she was kind of fangirling over him. Watch my video from last week so you can get all that information. And Grant actually says that she ended up breaking it off with him because her parents were worried about her and she loves her parents. And he said, I kind of sat in my jail cell thinking about it and realizing that she's me and I'm Sylvie in this relationship. It's utterly ridiculous, and it's really frustrating to know that he was able to even enact this whole fantasy once again while he's supposed to be serving the penalty for killing his entire family. I mean, I really wish that Sylvie would be more open to contributing to this project. Just talking to you, even if it was like, off the record. Even though Grant has Mary, he's still opining over Sylvie. Most likely because he just wants attention, 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 attention. And we see here that when he talks to the producers of the show, he's basically like, you gotta get Sylvie in on this. Like, even if it's off the record, which like, how would that benefit the producers? But it's like very important to Grant because he wants some kind of closure, some acknowledgement from Sylvie of everything that's happened. Because before he came up with this fake letter that he said he received, he had not heard, he'd let us know, he had not heard one word from Sylvie and he wasn't hearing from any family or friends while he was in prison. He was completely abandoned and I think the only reason he cares about that is because he cares about those shallow, shitty relationships he had primarily with Sylvie. He wants that back. He wants his obsession um, back entertaining him. But I don't really see him as actually having any connection to the person and we'll hear more about that later. Let's say, and they all look the same. And as far as I understand, we sort of had an incomplete address for Sylvia. 
Is this right? So we have a... So then the director ends up flying to Bulgaria and getting someone to help him who speaks the language and they go out looking for Sylvia because they want to interview her obviously for the documentary. They're having a rough time and um, we're going to see what happens with that. Beat down or you've lost so much over and over and over again. And it's, it's so hurtful. Okay, now in episode three comes the big moment. Grant has lost his appeals. He says that the court didn't even take a look at it. They thought it was so ridiculous. And he's realizing that he's stuck there forever and it's so hurtful for him, right? In the next sentence, Grant says something totally contradictory to everything he's told us in the past. I actually tell the truth. And the truth is that I did commit those crimes and I did do those murders. And that is obviously currently what I'm in prison for right now. Grant finally publicly admits to murdering his parents and his very wonderful, very close older brother, Cody Amato. And he admits to it right after saying something like, it's just so hurtful that they won't listen to me about my appeals. Wow. Something is so off. Something is so bizarre. Something is really wrong with Grant Amato. He's finally admitted to these murders. We have to pray that this confession gives the friends and family of the Amato family some measure of peace. But I know it didn't really give me a lot of peace because what Grant had to say next was so disgusting and led me to fully understand that he is clearly an extreme psychopath. Grant, can you tell me where the where the gun is? Grant admits to the murders and the producer wants information about where the murder weapon is located. He wants to take that to the police. Grant gives him the information like clear as day. We hear him saying the words that it was buried in his friend's backyard. The producer goes to the police and has them dig up the entire backyard and it's never found. The police literally say to the producer, this guy is just an absolute liar. He lies about everything. The producer returns to the prison to let Grant know that they were unable to find the gun and it really put the producer in a bad place because he's got all these police officers out there looking for it. And Grant just wears a very bizarre, crazy, wide smile. On his face. <laughs> I don't know. That's so weird. That's so weird that it wasn't there. Um, once again, what we are seeing from Grant ultimately has come down to psychopathy. He has no feelings or connections to other people. Everything is about himself. He lives in his own selfish world. He doesn't have any empathy or um, feel any kind of true value in the human beings around him. Right. Because that's very strange that um, that it's not there anymore. That is crazy. Oh my god. Grant's responses make me so angry. It's like he gets off on tricking people. He likes hearing that like all the police went out there and they couldn't find it. The expression on his face is so disgusting. And I feel like he even likes tricking this director who's been working with him, trying to help him, trying to find Sylvie. He's just really into the fact that like he got these people to go out there and nothing happened and they'll never know the truth. But um Yes, once again, I am being truthful. Okay, there's so much more to this docu-series. I know not all of you can watch it because you're not in the United States or that you may not have access to purchasing it. So I'm gonna give you a few last tidbits of what I think is so important to know about the docu-series, but when you watch it yourself, I mean, there's just so many twists and turns and little pieces of information that I'm not sharing with you here. So first and foremost, they find Sylvie. Um, they're only able to communicate with her over the phone, and she makes it clear that she wants nothing to do with Grant and nothing to do with this docu-series. And she basically tells them, I've been going through therapy for years and years to try to deal with what happened. And I absolutely do not want to get involved with this again, and that's the only information that they are able to get out of her. They let Grant know about it, and he puts that stupid, wide grin on his face again, and just is kind of like, hmm, interesting. Interesting to know that it affected her so much. Okay. This kind of goes into what Mary has to say at the very end of the documentary, okay? 
Grant makes some statements about why he killed his family and what it comes down to really, and Mary agrees with all of this, is that it's not really about Sylvie. It's about the fact that he didn't like them. He did not like that he was less successful than his father and his brother. He says, I'm a person with a big ego, and they were tearing my ego apart, making me go to therapy. I felt completely embarrassed that I was this loser on the couch with all these problems, and I didn't want to be around it anymore. And I told them I needed $50,000 to get the hell out of there, and they wouldn't give it to me. What's wrong with them? That's literally his entire response to all of this. He also goes into a monologue about how he feels that he was being a really kind and good and empathetic person by killing them in the way that he did. That he was really thinking, he literally says this, he was really thinking about them. He was thinking that they wouldn't want to know that it was him that did this, that they wouldn't want to suffer. And he just really feels like he's always so empathetic, even when he's doing something that people don't like. He's doing it in an empathetic way. Mary comes on the screen towards the end, and she lets us know that it's her opinion that none of this was ever about Sylvie, that her relationship with Grant, you can see there are two peas in the pod. I really feel like she gets it, and she flat out says, like, he didn't like being a loser. He didn't like it, and these people were kind of throwing it in his face, so he didn't like them, and he was done with them. That is why Grant Amato got rid of his family, including his older brother who had his entire life ahead of him. Cody Amato was loved by all, and he was quite successful with a girlfriend who we meet if you watch... Um, the court transcripts, you can learn a little bit about her. It is such a tragedy that his life was cut so short by the person he was trying to help and support and give love to. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I believe it's quite a possibility that what was going on in the Amato home is that they always realized that something was wrong with Grant, okay? Um, as a nurse who's worked in the pediatric psychiatric facilities across the nation. Um, I have definitely been around families, even very good and loving and wonderful and supportive and positive families who sometimes have a child that they literally are bringing to our facility because there's something wrong with him and we don't understand. And it's not depression and it's not ADHD. And as we get into really reviewing what's going on with this child, we are seeing the start of psychopathic traits in childhood. It would not be diagnosed, um, but we have kids that are killing animals, kids that are starting fires, kids that are showing zero empathy towards others, and they are not necessarily coming from abusive situations. So um, we have no way to know for sure exactly what that family was like behind closed doors, but I do believe that they realized something was wrong with Grant. And this may have been one of the reasons why Cody had such a close relationship to him, that maybe he felt like, as a big brother, it was his job to try to help his weird, bizarre younger brother make it through the world. Maybe Cody was just such a good person that when he looked at his younger brother, it was like looking at someone with a disability, and that's why he brought him along with all of his friends. He brought him along to Japan. He paid for everything for him. He always supported him right up until the last minute when Grant Amato ruthlessly killed Cody for no other reason but that he didn't like the people around him looking at him like he was a loser. Now Cody is in prison and receiving allegedly hundreds of letters a day. He'll probably start receiving more after this docu-series, uh, but I'm still grateful that this series came out because this is a case that's always haunted me and I find it really satisfying to at least know that there's a conclusion in which we can all say for sure that Grant committed the crimes and that he is exactly where he needs to be. All right, thank you so much for joining me down this rabbit hole. I do have some feelers out to some of the people who were close friends of the family, and I just wanted to get some feedback about what they thought went on in the Amato home when Grant was a child, if they had anything to say about any of that. If I get any responses, I will, I will be bringing them to you, but I hope that you will be able to check out the docuseries because it is quite shocking. And I'm so glad that all of you joined me down this rabbit hole. Please join me next time.
I think there's a lot of people who look at Grant and would say, like, oh, this guy's an expert liar, manipulator, a man of masks. Do you think you ever met the real Grant? Probably not, honestly, 